Thank you. Ik spreek in een beetje Duits, dus so thank you for allowing me to speak with you today in English. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Dr. Mentrup uh, for such a warm welcome here to Karlsruhe. I have enjoyed my uh, day and a half here. And um, uh, thank you to Jorg and to Anna and Hendrik for um, making this such a, a welcome trip to Germany. Um, and I'm uh, very grateful to be able to talk to you today about cybersecurity and its strategic importance. I'm going to give a quick, brief history of the internet, and I'm going to talk about the economic importance, and then I'm going to talk about some of the corporate responsibilities, and then I'm going to uh, finalize with what it means to Karlsruhe and what I think this community can do, not only for Germany, but for the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> I like to start with a quote from Albert Einstein, um, and uh, and because I think that when he looks at problems, um, and we've created these opportunities, we can't actually always use the same thinking to return to the way that we created them, and um, and so I think that that's important because he's affected all of our lives. <clears throat> so I go to the internet, the past, the present, and the future. Not many people, I think, really remember that the uh, internet was created back in the early 1960s um, by, as a project for the Ministry of Defense in the United States to enable communications during a time of nuclear uh, crisis. And the first transmission of the internet in the United States was between two universities in California in, on October 29th, 1969. And I realized that the first internet communication here in Germany didn't occur until 1984. Um, and, it, and it was here at uh, the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. Uh, but the first transmission from the US to Europe actually occurred in 1972. In, right after 1984 and 1985 was the transition of the internet to what we know it today. It was when the dot com top-level domain was created. And that allowed for the commerce and the economic backbone to be created. And then it wasn't until 1990, up in Switzerland and CERN, that the World Wide Web was created. And that allowed us to click, connect, and search wide varieties of information. Um, and actually here in Karlsruhe, you posted much of your university information on the internet to be the first real hub of the information society to allow us to click, connect, and search and open the world to the information. That information then led to the birth of small devices in your hand. How many people have a cell phone with them right now? majority of the audience. How many people have more than one device, at least two, three devices in your hands? Yes, many. I'm traveling today with three. Um, and uh, thank God I have this, because we had a small technical difficulty. And, um, and so we can actually communicate. So, but that requirement of all of us being able to click, connect, and search to information in our palm of our hand now requires that we have high speed bandwidth and being able to have wireless internet everywhere. And again, here in Karlsruhe, you have Wi-Fi throughout the city. It was one of the first cities in Germany and probably most of Europe that's free to your citizens. And that is helping enable the digital economy. As we move from three devices to five devices and then connecting our cars and our homes and everything to the internet that's known as the internet of things, we're going to have to start to think differently about the technology and the intersection of security and privacy. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about because we don't have that much time to start to solve this problem. Over the course of the last 10 to 15, 20 years, we have embedded information communication technology into every part of our life. Our companies are gaining efficiency and productivity from it, 10% efficiency and 40% productivity for embedding it. And so we're modernizing our manufacturing plants to be embedded with the internet. We are enabling our consumers and our citizens to shop for goods and services over the internet. 
We've created buildings that are smart in their energy consumption, and then our energy is being delivered over the internet through smart grids that allow us as citizens to control that information and our energy consumption over the internet. And then at ranging from our financial services to our transportation to research and development to managed healthcare records on the internet, if you think about from the time that you woke up this morning, when you turned on the lights, it likely came over the internet. You turned on the radio or you checked your cell phone, it likely came over the internet. You drove to work or you drove here and you passed through a stoplight I'm sure it was controlled through the internet. And I, I challenge you to think about all the different aspects of your life and how much, if not all of it, is touching the internet, which is why we need to think about it being secure. The G20 nations, per the first question, are counting on the internet. It's the digital agenda, the digital agenda of Germany, the digital agenda of Europe, the broadband initiative of the United States, that for every person we get connected to the internet and for every business that becomes dependent on the internet, we're going to see at least 4% GDP growth in our countries. And if you're in India or a South Africa or a Brazil, you could see as much as 10% GDP growth. And that's why all of our countries are pushing for the digital agenda and for our digital consumption. But in the same breath, we're starting to recognize that there's a high degree of criminality on the internet now, exploiting those dependencies that we have. The World Economic Forum in Davos talks about it as one of the number one threats from the technology risk, uh, that they're worried about the criminality, but then more importantly, they're worried about the attacks or the infrastructure degradation that could come from a devastating um, attack. In India, they're talking about the importance of this from their uh, tender process, from the bids and proposals and for their businesses to be able to do um, work with their government and work with their citizens. In the United States, we talk about that the threats to our internet are one of the most important economic and national security risks that we are facing as a country. And President Putin talks about this as something that nations need to control, that we can no longer trust companies to control the future of our internet, that nations not, must intercede. And then, of course, as part of the cyber dialogue between the United States and Germany, we really must address the privacy and security concerns and how we respect each other's data across borders and within countries. So today, we have embedded our banking and finance, our health, our education system, and the next generation of our goods and services are all delivered over only one infrastructure. It's not a lot of infrastructures. It's not 10, it's not 11, it's not 15, it's one. It's coming over one infrastructure and that's the internet. And we've embedded the internet and our businesses with poorly engineered products that are highly vulnerable to attack and exploitation, which is what the criminals are taking advantage of. And what we've seen for the GDP growth over the last two to three decades is now at risk. And so that's why our countries are talking about the importance of security and privacy. There are more than 100 countries that are cyber capable, that are, that are exploiting the, our use of the technology and taking advantage of the vulnerabilities in those technologies. And many non-state actors like Anonymous or like Hezbollah terrorist organizations are also using the internet to play in this domestic and international space. Their objectives vary though. And when we talk about cybersecurity, I think we need to be clear in conversation. There are at least six activities that uh, affect cybersecurity. And the first is political activism. We have a pretty famous political activist in the United States. His name is Edward Snowden. 
Um, and the, the, the guys here wanted to give me a thumb drive and to put in my computer. And I don't trust thumb drives. Um, and Edward Snowden creatively used a thumb drive to put into a computer and take all of the information from our national security agency and has hence given it to multiple reporters, of which today Eric Greenwald came out with his new book, um, of which I'm sure is a bestseller on Amazon. Edward Snowden disagreed with the policies and activities of the United States government and wanted to bring transparency to those activities. And we have all learned uh, what, what some of those activities were. So he's a political activist. We have other names for him, but he's a political activist. In Egypt, though, or Turkey, or Iran, citizens are using the internet, like Twitter, to organize in the streets to protest against their governments. And then sometimes they're successful in overthrowing their governments. So one man's political activist in Turkey, or the United States, or Egypt, or Iran, could be another man's terrorist. And how we think about that definition changes depending upon which country we sit in and what that political activism is doing and threatening. That is not to be the same, though, as, as cyber criminality or organized crime on the internet. My personal information is worth money on the internet. Your credit card is worth money on the internet. Um, and of course, our bank accounts are worth money on the internet. Uh, in the United States, uh, my uh, MasterCard or Visa uh, credit card might be worth one or two dollars uh, to a cyber criminal. And then we're seeing real bank robbers take advantage of our ATMs, our uh, bank systems, and steal money from our ATMs. Last year in May, here in Europe, we saw uh, $45 million stole stolen in 30 minutes in 30 cities, and some of the criminals were arrested in Dusseldorf. It was quite a sophisticated criminal operation to take advantage of the weaknesses in our financial system and the weaknesses in our ATM machines. Those ATM machines are even more vulnerable now because they're based on an old operating system by Microsoft, and Microsoft has chosen not to continue to update that technology. So for those of you, as you're doing ATM banking now, you're more vulnerable than you were four weeks ago. But organized crime is really after your money. The, the ones and zeros of your bank is worth money. It's worth dollars and euros. That's not the same as the third category, which is intellectual property theft. Intellectual property theft is when you're uh, downloading inadvertently uh, malicious software to your computer, and it's allowing somebody to illegally copy the information off of your computer, off of your corporate enterprise. And most of our companies have been targeted to, um, to and by others to steal or illegally copy their intellectual property. It's usually to advance other countries' economic agendas so they don't have to invest in research and development, so they don't have to think about the next generation car design or pharmaceutical design or smart grid technology. Intellectual property theft has been named by Chancellor Merkel and President Obama and other leaders as one of the key problems facing our countries from cybersecurity. Uh, in the United States, we talk about it as the greatest transfer of wealth in our time that's all happening over the internet, right, right in front of us, right in front of our eyes. The next category is espionage, which most of our countries actually do conduct to help inform our leaders of uh, capabilities and intentions of other countries and other adversaries. Um, and it's as time old um, practice, the internet just makes it easier and with some greater degree of anonymity. The last two areas, though, that I think are the most important that most of our countries are not talking about enough is this disruption of service and the degradation or destruction of property. As we adopt more of this technology and we embed each of the essential services, delivery of power, delivery of water, your use of your telephone, all coming over this one infrastructure, the internet, it's at a higher risk of being degraded by those who wish it harm. 
And in the United States and in uh, Eastern Europe and, and some parts of Asia, there are people who are actually degrading our ability to, to connect to our banking system and our financial services, purposely degrading or disrupting the service to our citizens. As we connect more and more things to the internet, we'll have more and more disruption of things to the internet, especially for those who wish us harm. And then finally, we are seeing destruction of property. Uh, since the use of a military-purposed uh, internet weapon uh, against Iran's ability to create nuclear weapons, this is called Stuxnet, since the time of Stuxnet, We've actually seen it proliferate because people were able to widely study it. And we've seen a variant of that weapon used against key corporations, one of which was Saudi Aramco uh, uh, last year, of which Saudi Aramco experienced a weapon that was delivered on a thumb drive, so on a stick that you put into your computer. And it destroyed 30,000 computers 30,000 computers wiped out within 24 hours. That represented 70% of the IT systems of Saudi Aramco. For those of you who work in major corporations, this was a material event for that company, and then it caused all companies around the world to begin to discuss what does destruction of property mean and how would we actually prevent it. And you might be surprised that most of these infected infrastructures, the most infected infrastructure is the United States. Um, we have many devices that are infected that are using, being used by criminals and being used to bring harm to other countries. Uh, and Germany is right up there. She also has many infected computers that are being used and harnessed to bring about crime and destruction to others around the world. And it's incumbent upon us as G20 countries and as leaders of the world that we should be cleaning up our own infrastructures first. And the current trends indicate that this situation is gonna get worse in terms of frequency and gravity um, and maybe increase faster than the benefits. And why is that? Because we are quick to adopt the next technology it's coming in almost every quarter, or every six months. And we like it. We like the technology. It's fun to use. It's easy to connect. But they're more and more vulnerable, and they're being more and more exploited every day uh, by those who wish to, uh, to steal our money or to bring us harm. So I think it's time to change the conversation. And I have been working very hard over the last five years to raise awareness in the United States and the rest of the world and to change the conversation because we're only measuring the benefits of information communications technology and we're not necessarily measuring the liability, but some of our countries are, and I'm going to highlight just a few of those statistics. So the Netherlands, and I do a lot of work there, they did a, a very sophisticated study by their research organization, the TNO, and they did six different studies and came out with the same answer that in 2010, the Netherlands grew by 1.6% in GDP. And that's through largely the digital agenda and the adoption of the information communications technology. But when she measured how much she was losing to e-crime, intellectual property theft, and identity theft, stealing your credit cards and your identity and creating a false persona, she measured it to be at least 2% of her GDP. That's 10 billion euros. It's an awful lot, 2% of your GDP of a G20 country who's considered very technology enabled. The United States, we measured it as well recently. In 2012, uh, the United States grew by 2.2%, and right now the United States is not growing. We're, we're flat GDP, um, it's less than 1%. And we measured in a very sophisticated study that we were losing just to intellectual property theft, illegally copying the information from our companies, 1% of our GDP. That's $300 billion. Remember, we only have 300 million citizens. Think about that, of how much we're losing per capita. And then 
Germany and one of your industry associations here also did a study that said that you were losing, in 2010, you grew, you had a great year, you grew by 4.2%. I'm hoping that you're gonna grow by 4% this year too. We need you to grow, to bring all of the rest of us up. And in, four, in, in 2010, you lost 1.5% of your GDP just to intellectual property theft, 24 billion euros. Now think about that, when you have to do the packages to help the rest of Europe economically survive of how much we're losing to just intellectual property theft, and that doesn't even account for the crime and the fraud that's happening here and elsewhere in Europe. So as you change the conversation, we need executive awareness. It's increasing, but is it increasing fast enough? No, I don't think so because we haven't put the losses in economic terms so that I can go home and I can talk about it with my mom or my son of why our taxes are raised or why somebody's gonna lose their job or what the next problem is going to be. We have to talk about what's at stake. For our companies, it's reputation and brand. Um, for some of our products, it's the price point. Is it expensive or is it inexpensive? For our for our consumers, it's about customer confidence. Do I trust shopping at this organization? Do I trust this bank with my money? Um, for others, for your telecommunications or for your energy grid, it's about quality of service. I expect my lights to be able to go on when I flip the switch 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or I expect my water to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For others, this ability to provide protection that you should expect that they're not going to lose your personal data or your credit card. And if you're in the military or you're in the healthcare service, it could actually be lives that are at stake because of the way that we have put so much dependent on the internet. And that most penetrations occur against simple things. We say in the United States and, and other countries have said the same thing, like in Australia, that we need to have a better understanding of what are the devices, those cell phones and tablets that you bring in, what is authorized and what is unauthorized? Do we even know who the users are on our enterprise? And if 80% of, the, um, of the breaches in your organization happen against the top eight items that are actually pretty easy to do based on process and procedure, then we have a long way to go because I can exploit those things that are in the bottom part of the list more easily. I think we need to start measuring what matters. I work with many corporations in the US and elsewhere, and um, for those that have been breached, sometimes it takes them more than 170 days to discover that there's somebody not supposed to be in on their networks. Think about that, that's almost six months that somebody who's not supposed to be in your network is living in your network, perhaps stealing your information, illegally copying it, or stealing your money, or tracking you as an individual. The average cost for a record is $275 per record. So in the United States, we just had a very famous breach against one of our retail outlets called Target. If, if you're familiar with Target, I don't know if that's, it's similar in Europe. We had 100 million customers' data that was stolen, 100 million. So per person, $275, that's a lot, $275 million uh, just for the replacement of the cards. As companies get breached, it's a minimum of $250,000 just to investigate. And most companies will spend anywhere from $1 million to $5 million, is $5 million is the estimate here in Germany, to investigate the breach and clean up the breach. If companies begin to start to measure what's happening on a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, most companies experience two breaches. That's a lot, it's a lot of money, especially when you're thinking about a digital balance sheet. I think we can learn from our victims, whether it's Siemens down the road, or it's Heartland in the United States, or it's Saudi Aramco, um, that there are, or Sony in Japan, Every company has something that we can learn from, just as every government we can learn from, and that there's mechanisms that we should be putting in place to protect ourselves, to protect our data, to protect our infrastructures, and to protect our country. 
Um, because this is such a technical community, I wanted to, to give three things. As we move to the Internet of Things, we're facing at least three technological shortfalls, of which this innovation community, I think, should be researching. The first is, as we move to um, more and more of these uh, devices connected to the internet, there's going to be a new version of the internet protocol that we're going to be operating within our infrastructures. And it's very easy to hide within those infrastructures, um, within this new internet protocol. And it's also very easy to track you as an individual. And so how do you start to bring about the privacy and security conversation in the next generation of the internet? And then, how do I start to validate that it's you who you are with your device to the data that you want to have access to, especially if you've stored your information in the cloud someplace else so you can access it 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Can I actually track that data for all transactions and assure that you are who you say you are? And then as you put that data in the cloud, if you're using a Google or you're using some other 24 by seven infrastructure, what does their service level agreement say? And are they promising to protect your data? And do they control, have very strong controls in place to protect your data and your enterprise? I would argue that the answer to that is no. So I think that, and I've worked on a methodology over the last uh, year and a half, if we begin to measure what we're losing in addition to what we're gaining, that it could change the way that we as societies and individuals begin to think about the internet and then invest in the derivative value of both. We're measuring economic prosperity, productivity, 40%, efficiency, 10%, innovation and modernization of our core infrastructures. But we're talking about infrastructure protection. We're talking about intellectual property protection and defense of the homeland. And yes, in some countries, regime stability. But are we measuring that? So I identified the top 20 countries that had the strongest ICT development, adoption of that technology. And then I, uh, I took the next set of data of the G20 countries because they represent 90% of the wealth of the world, 80% of international trade, 64% of the world's population, and 84% of the, the world's energy consumption, which brought in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And then I included the top G20 GDP countries, which believe it or not, are not in the top 20 of ICT and not in the G20, who knew? And that brings you in Spain. And that's 35 countries, of which I did an analysis of over the course of this last year. And if anybody would like to see that analysis, it's available on the Harvard website, along with this methodology. And I looked at these 35 countries, and I measured them. And I looked at them of how well are they doing against five criteria. Is there a national strategy? Is anybody in charge of that digital agenda and the security agenda? Have you identified somebody who's going to work across the different departments and agencies and identify the commercial sectors upon which are going to restore the resilience in your country? Is there a national incident response capability that could help with the restoration and alert system to your industry? And um, the third area is, are you investing in the legal uh, capacity to prosecute criminals and to limit or m minimize the criminality? Are you working across borders? Are you measuring the GDP losses? The fourth area is harder for most countries of establishing a mechanism to share information, information from your companies to your government or your government to your industry so that they can better protect themselves. And then finally, is there truly a research and development initiative that the government and industry are funding to make the better uh, for a future of that infrastructure internet entanglement? When you start to look at it, most of the G20 countries um, are, are not working across all five of those areas. Most have a security strategy most have an incident response capability from two persons to 200 persons. Um, not many are investing in the legal capacity or the cyber to deal with the cyber criminality, and even less are dealing with research and development. 
When you look at Germany, Germany is in the top 20 for ICT development. Um, she's very ICT enabled as a country. She's number four for the GDP producing nations globally. She does have a national strategy. It was produced in 2011. There is somebody who's been identified to help coordinate across the government. And you have signed the Cybercrime Treaty, uh, the Council of Europe, the Budapest Convention. There is information sharing across the government. I think there's R&D, but I couldn't confirm it, and funding along those lines. But are you measuring the degradation at a national level of what in the future direction from the ICT development? I think you're losing more than 1.5% of your GDP. And that should be on the top of the agenda of your government. I think that identifying the key industries is essential for the recovery and resilience of your critical services. That it's not about critical infrastructures anymore, it's about critical services that you depend on as a citizen and as a country. You're in the top five of most infected infrastructures. I know it's hard, we, the United States are the number one. But you're in the top five of infected infrastructures. You have a botnet initiative, but is it enough to clean up your infrastructure? And then the information sharing and alert system, and then market levers that could be used to incubate the innovation like here in Karlsruhe and have them work both on the internet opportunities, but then securing those internet opportunities as we move forward. S success really requires a national conversation. And I don't think any of our countries are having a national conversation. It requires executive bandwidth. What does that mean? It's beyond a speech. It's beyond just one speech or a speech once a year. It's true commitment from our senior leaders of industry and government to say this is what's important to us and it's going to require investment and innovation. And yes, it's going to be tough choices as us as citizens and us as a country. And we're running out of time because we have embedded everything on the internet because you do want the next generation technology, because your companies do want the productivity and efficiency. We need to recognize that the government doesn't always know best, that sometimes the, the companies know best, but it's the government's responsibility to enable the companies to do what's in our best interest. That it's not just one country going alone, that it's all of our countries working together, that we do all share borders, and it is some of our responsibility to lead this as a global conversation. And we can't be afraid of the technology, we have to still embrace the technology, but not while creating unnecessarily economic exposure or security risks to our countries and our companies. The current trends suggest that things are on a, on a negative or a downward slope, which require us, us to really start to talk about what's needed. The lack of resilience in our core infrastructure, remember, we've put everything on one infrastructure. It's not as resilient as we hoped it would be. It's causing a challenge for our future. And I think that it's important now that we know what is our degree of readiness, cyber readiness, what could we do and should we be doing in the future, and then how can we take advantage of of centers of excellence like Karlsruhe to change our readiness level to make us more secure and resilient and still see the economic growth and potential that we and our leaders are expecting from the internet and the internet opportunity. So why did I come to Karlsruhe? Aside from that Dr. Mentor asked me, um, and, uh, and this is really a, a beautiful city, you're the third largest IT center in Europe. You're an early adopter of the technology. You were the first to put university information on that, on the internet uh, for the World Wide Web to search, um, you know, click, connect, search, uh, click, connect, and search around the world. You're a home through the Cyber Forum, which is what we're, some of the previous speakers were talking about, to over 3,000 companies that are adopting this technology and creating great opportunities for our businesses. You're the hub of university and technical talent. You are known for your engineering. Can you apply that engineering, that same skill set, to creating secure internet applications, a more resilient infrastructure that's embedded in the internet? 
And that research and development and this innovation hub of talent and technology and really interesting um, ideas is a place where this could, Karlsruhe and Germany can serve as a, as a really interesting hub of cybersecurity solutions not just internet applications and business applications, but business applications and internet applications that were well designed with core engineering principles, with very few flaws, and that could make the internet a more prosperous place that's protecting our data, creating a better secure environment, secure transactions, and a more resilient internet infrastructure entanglement that we need in the next five to 10 years. It has been my pleasure to be here in Karlsruhe, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shun. Thank you very much, Melissa Hathaway. Meine Damen und Herren, Sie sind herzlich eingeladen, Fragen zu stellen, auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch, ganz egal. Ich werde mich bemühen, zu übersetzen. Well, first, and thank you for the Hathaway Karlsruhe speech you gave us. Many thanks. I would ask just one question. How do you see the relation between the governmental agencies and all what uh, comes with it and the private companies? 50 by 50 in this task or should the government take the leadership on this? Thank you. Uh, um es kurz uh, zu übersetzen, das braucht Herr Bock ja nicht zu machen. Ich hatte mich zunächst mal für die Karlsruher Rede von Melda Hathaway bedankt und hatte dann die Frage gestellt, wie so das Verhältnis sein soll zwischen den staatlichen und den privaten Firmen auf diesem Thema. Okay. Will you translate the answer? Or? No, yeah, I'll, tr I'll translate. Yes? Yeah. Okay. I'll try. Um, so I'll go slow. Um, uh, thank you for the question. I think that um, the private sector is designing and building and operating all of these core technologies and infrastructures. They'll be responsible for restoring it in the time of crisis. And so I, I see that the burden is more than 80% on the private sector. I think that our governments need to exercise different market levers to ensure that the private sector does the right thing. This is a combination of um, incentives and regulation. Most of our companies right now, or countries, are only talking about regulation or penalty-based control inserted into the system. And I think that it would be important to begin to talk about tax incentives um, and uh, market adoption so you get to quick adoption because regulation is going to slow adoption to doing the right thing. And, and that's where I see things. And most of our governments believe that they're 80% of the solution and the industry is 20% of the solution. And I don't think that's the case. Okay. I, I work in both sides, so I know what reality is. Also sie sagt, sie arbeitet auf beiden Seiten, sie kann das ganz gut überblicken. Sie sieht ähm, den Anteil bei der privaten Industrie bei 80 Prozent, bei den Regierungen bei 20 Prozent. Ähm, sagt die Regierung, wie in allem, sollten natürlich äh, steuernd eingreifen. Im Moment machen sie das aber überwiegend über Strafen. Das sollte eigentlich ähm, nicht überwiegend über Strafen passieren, sondern zum Beispiel über Steuern und andere ähm, Regulierungen. Im Moment gibt es da eine Fehleinschätzung bei den Regierungen, dass sie eben ähm, eigentlich bei sich 80 Prozent sehen, bei der Industrie 20 Prozent und das ist es eben nicht. Es ist 80 Prozent bei der Industrie, was getan werden muss, aber die Regierungen müssen es entsprechend regulieren. Weitere Fragen, meine Damen und Herren? Any more questions? Hello, uh, Ms. Hathaway, thank you for the lecture. Um, my question kind of points into the direction of um, individuals in this global uh, phenomenon like Mr. Snowden. How can, yeah, in, individuals, how can people without an organization behind them alter the, the direction in which we are as a global community 
as a society in the internet age evolving? How can and how should they alter things? Ja, ähm, ich habe gefragt, ob äh, wie Individuen wie Snowden die ähm, Richtung, in die die Gesellschaft sich entwickelt, verändern können und ob sie es verändern sollten. Oder? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm hoping this is going to answer it. I think that us as individuals and us as companies and us as governments need to think about what is our most important asset. And right now, I, th I think it's our information. It's our data. And we haven't thought about it that way before. Our most important asset as a person might be our home or our car or our life, right? Um, our most important asset as a business is um, you know, our market presence and, and governments. It's about our infrastructure and our sovereignty. But at the heart of all of it is our data. So, um, uh, and some of us are worried about our information being collected by governments. And we don't think so much about the information that's being collected by companies as citizens, right? So, you know, I don't know how many people use Google, Gmail, any Google things here. And, um, you know, I personally try not to use Google uh, because Google's got a very good dossier, you know, knows everything about people who use Google, and they're pretty transparent that it's their job to collect data on you, um, and they're going to sell it. So if you don't want to be tracked on your cell phone, and you don't want to get a coupon for the store, um, and you don't want people to read your emails, then you shouldn't use applications or allow them to have access to your data. It's the same thing from a company. If you want to ensure that it's protected and it's not going to leave on a thumb drive, right, on a, on a 99 cent thumb drive, then you need to protect it so that it's not easy to copy from the cloud or from an enterprise and not easily taken out of that infrastructure. And the same as governments. So what can I do as a person or what can I do as an enterprise, et cetera? I, I need to start to think differently about how I'm using that technology and what's being collected with that technology. When you get your cell phone, you opt in to everything that's all the features and all the features on the phone. They might not all be benefits. Um, and so people, the cell phone um, provider uh, and any application you download on it is then going to use your data because you've automatically opted in. And perhaps you should look at the privacy and security settings to opt out, right? And as citizens, that's counterintuitive. I bought it, I want to use it. Um, and the same for an enterprise. I bought it, I want to use it. I love all these features. I didn't know about these other features. Well, now you have to ask what other features are part of this technology that I didn't want to have part of this technology. And then I have to click a button so that it no longer tracks me or no longer has access to my data. It's very difficult when me as a person, I might get a new cell phone, different phone every year, right? I don't, I don't replace that often, but some people do. And then you have to learn all these new features that were put on that technology or on the tablet or in the application that you really liked. And we're not asking the right questions as people or citizens using the technology. We just automatically trust it. And I think perhaps you should automatically distrust it until proven that you can trust it. And that's counterintuitive to the way you think about the technology today. Also. Lange Rede, kurze Zusammenfassung. Wir vertrauen der Technik viel zu sehr. Wir sollten viel mehr misstrauen. Schließlich sind die Daten eigentlich unser höchstes Gut. Dessen sind wir uns aber auch nicht wirklich bewusst. Immer noch nicht. Was geben wir alles ab an Google und an die anderen Konzerne, die unsere Daten sammeln? Wird ja in Deutschland gerade sehr, sehr heftig diskutiert. Also wir brauchen deutlich mehr Misstrauen gegenüber diesen Datensammlern. Ich würde sagen, so könnte man es zusammenfassen. So, weitere Fragen? Alle hinten, warum kommt ihr nicht nach vorne? Dann wäre es viel einfacher, wenn ihr euch nicht, nicht so verteilen würdet. Mit der Hellway, von your point of sight in both worlds, the uh, private industries and the governance, do you see a tendenz or a development to outtask security relevant tasks in the industry or back to the governance and what was your advice? So would you outtask some jobs 
to the private industries or would you recommend to do it in governmental state for a global tasking? Um, uh, Okay, auf Deutsch, ähm, ich würde mich dafür interessieren, wie es ausschaut mit der Aufgabenverteilung, ob äh, Fire the Way ist mehr als Aufgabe der Staaten sieht oder der privaten Industrie, wer die sicherheitsrelevanten Aufgaben in der IT übernehmen soll, ob sie die Tendenzen sieht und wo sie raten würde, dass es erledigt werden soll. Thank you for your question. Um, so it's it goes back to again responsibility and where is the best place to introduce the security. And um, so I, I think, again, I would turn to industry I would outtask some of it, perhaps not all of it, but some of it I think I would. Um, first, the, I would turn to um, my telecommunications service providers, internet service providers, because they really are providing that backbone for all these other infrastructures. They can see when you're infected, um, and they have the ability to uh, introduce broader security. And in fact, Germany leads the world with your internet service providers in providing this managed security service. And I think that that's important. Um, I wish the United States would impose some of the same rules on our telecommunications or internet service providers. Globally, if you were to then turn again to the telecommunications or internet service providers to provide that, You only have to deal with 25 companies to get 90 to 95% of the internet users. That's a small number. If you only have to work with 25 companies globally to introduce that security part process. So, um, and, and I have advocated for this and I've written about it. Um, that would probably be the number one thing I would do and then allow the governments to focus on more exquisite things that are um, important to your specific country. Also, sie hat untersucht, dass es eigentlich nur 25 Unternehmen weltweit sind, die für 90 Prozent der Internetsicherheit verantwortlich wären. Das heißt, wenn die entsprechend den Dienst leisten würden, dann wären wir ganz gut aufgestellt. Sie sagt, Deutschland ist dafür und sie würde sich wünschen, dass es in den USA bei den Unternehmen, die diese Dienste anbieten, schon so weit wäre wie in Deutschland. Weitere Fragen? Any more questions? Just to add quite a simple question. How much data do you have in the cloud? Oh, um. Do you use the cloud? That's a question. <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, I have uh, my uh, email um, is accessible through a cloud-based portal. Um, and then it, uh, it leaves, in theory, it leaves um, 30 days, store for 30 days. And I don't store anything else in the cloud. Okay, die Frage war, wie sie in der Cloud ähm, unterwegs ist und sie sagt eben, also bei den E-Mails, da geht es zwangsläufig über die Cloud, aber ansonsten überhaupt nicht. Das heißt, sie ist offensichtlich sehr misstrauisch. Noch Fragen? So, I have one more question. Ich habe noch eine Frage. Um, Sie haben uns gesagt, die Nation, kein Land ist cyber ready. You told us that no country is cyber ready yet. So, obviously most of the companies aren't cyber ready yet. Die meisten Firmen sind das eigentlich auch nicht. But we're already starting the Internet of Everything. Don't we have to create a, a bigger awareness everywhere? but not only in the countries or in the companies, but in every, each of us has to be aware of the risks. Because uh, if, if you have the, the governments being aware, it, it's not enough. Every one of us has to be aware of the risks. Jeder von uns muss doch eigentlich das Risikobewusstsein haben. Jeder von uns muss die Prävention bekommen haben, die Präventionsmaßnahmen, sonst haben wir keine Chance. Um. So you, you might laugh at me, because as an American, um, I agree. Uh, we need all citizens to be aware of what is important, and we need companies to do more, and we need countries to do more, because nobody's really cyber ready. So in the United States, um, I teach a class, and I use um, I used US movies, Hollywood, to talk about the problem, you know, of Uh, what is hacking, and I use, you know, uh, two movies, uh, Angelina Jolie and Hackers, it's 
not a very good movie, but it's, it's fun. And it was when she was 14. And um, Matthew Broderick. And then I use another movie to talk about cybercrime with John Travolta, Swordfish. Great movie. It's timeless. you got to watch it. Um, when it comes to espionage, I use a movie um, that has Robert Redford in it called Sneakers. And if you haven't seen these movies, these are classic American cyber movies, right? So I use that to start to talk about this. And each one of these has a real world, now corollary story, adjacent story to the, whatever the movie was from a long time ago. So, but then how do you raise awareness? That's one way. You talk about the problem and, and you watch a movie. But in the United States, um, when we've had very difficult problems um, and we needed to create awareness among all of our country and all of our citizens, we, we turned to Disney, Disney and Hollywood. And we created, um, in the early 1970s, a series of cartoons, education cartoons, um, that played every, every morning for two hours to teach our children about American history and math and science and basic things because our, our schools were inadequate. We did the same in the 1960s for the space race of using Disney to actually design the science fairs in our schools to make math and science fun and cool with the astronauts. And we've done the same thing for other things. So if I were in charge today, I would hire Disney to create global awareness because they're really good at sticky stories that communicate to a four-year-old, a 40-year-old, and an 80-year-old. And, uh, and that might be just an American point of view, but Disney's pretty good at this stuff. So that's what I would do. Also eine Präventionsidee, die wir bisher hier bei unserem Karlsruher Forum für Cybersicherheit nicht gehört haben, Disney anheuern. Sie hat die schönen Beispiele aufgeführt, dass in den 60er Jahren ging es um Wissenschaftsbegeisterung, die zu wecken. Da lief dann eben morgens im Fernsehen liefen Disney-Filme für die Kinder. In den 70er Jahren hat man es mit amerikanischer Geschichte gemacht und damit erreicht man eben ungeheuer viele Kinder, die das dann mitnehmen in ihr Erwachsenenleben. Also sie würde, wenn sie es zu bestimmen hätte, tatsächlich Disney engagieren, um diese Cyber Security Wachsamkeit zu kreieren. So Thank you very much. One Thank last you. personal question, if, if there isn't any other one. Noch eine Frage? Do you have cybersecurity at home in your family? Of course. <laughs> um, your children? I have a 13 and 14 year old boys and, um, and we are, they are very cyber aware um, and they know that mom is going to do an internet search on them once or twice a, a month on what are their activities on the internet. They know that a thumb drive is not allowed in my house. Um, and uh, they actually um, help their friends understand when their computers get infected of how they got infected with the latest application that was fun to download. So, um, but yes, cybersecurity is important in my house and my children don't necessarily like it very much. Also ihre Kinder mögen es zwar nicht, aber sie hat den Daumen drauf, <laughs> offensichtlich. Thank you very much, <laughs> Melissa Hathaway. Thank you.